Good morning. How many of you think you're in the 930 service? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> A few of us, right? Um, we lost an hour of rest last night, but I think it's an opportunity for us to just be ready, be on our toes for what God is getting ready to do in our lives. This is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, and we are beginning a brand new sermon series. Now, some of you are scratching your heads wondering, what is Lent? What is she talking about? No, I'm not talking about what you find in your dryer or what you collect on your sweaters. Lent is a 40-day season of spiritual preparation in the church. It's 40 days that readies us for the transformation of Easter Sundays. Now, thousands of years ago, Christian churches used those 40 days of Lent as a spiritual boot camp. They used these 40 days to prepare people for the rigorous journey of faith. And that journey in the first couple centuries was rigorous. In fact, those 40 days were marked by spiritual d disciplines like fasting, that means not eating, praying, reading their Bible, serving the poor, and gathering together in small groups for spiritual instructions. They did this for 40 days so that they would be ready, ready to say yes to Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. Now, through the centuries, we have continued to use this practice, to use this time, the season of Lent, as a time for spiritual renewal for ourselves. It's a time for us to get honest with ourselves and to open ourselves up to God and to allow God to tether out the junk that lies deep within our souls. To say to God, okay, God, I am ready for your transformation. And to practice those spiritual disciplines that give God room in our lives to tether out that junk, to fast, to pray, to read our Bibles, to gather in small groups. You know, this pattern of 40 days was established throughout the Old Testament and also with Jesus while he was wandering in the Galilean wilderness. And we use this time to say, I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord, for the miracle of Easter. I am ready for the power of resurrection. Amen? Now, for the next six weeks, we are going to be looking at the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. We're going to be walking with Jesus and the disciples from the intimacy of the upper room all the way to the despair of the cross. You're not going to want to miss one week. We're going to make the Bible come alive right before your very eyes. You are going to experience the power of the passion. And today, we begin with the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. It is Thursday. Thursday. And Jesus is having an ordinary conversation with the disciples now, a couple of days earlier, things were anything but ordinary. You see, Jesus and the disciples had entered the city of Jerusalem. And when Jesus entered that city, he was greeted by loud shouts of praise. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Maybe some of you grew up in Sunday school and remember carrying palm branches as a little kid to celebrate Palm Sunday. Why? Because people laid out the palms. They laid down their coats. They celebrated the arrival of the triumphant King Jesus. But by now, things had changed. By now, the leaders of the synagogue, they had had enough of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus went into the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers. Jesus had went right to those synagogue leaders and he said, you know what? You focus too much on following the rules. He went right to those synagogue leaders and he said, you are nothing but white washed tombs. Basically, you're clean on the outside, but I see the death that exists inside of you. Needless to say, Jesus isn't making friends, is he? I mean, he's not out here making friends and all of a sudden we find Jesus and the disciples and it's in the midst of this tension it's in the midst of this chaos, the disciples ask a really dumb question. They say, Jesus, 
where are we going to have dinner? I mean, they are so concerned about where they're going to get their next meal. Jesus, where are we going to have dinner? But this meal is anything but ordinary. This is the last supper. It's the very last meal that Jesus will eat before he dies. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles or pull out your sermon notes. And we're going to take a look at Mark's gospel, the 14th chapter. Mark chapter 14, we're going to begin with verse 12. And this is what Mark has to say. On the first, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' Jesus's disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Where are we going to eat, Jesus, right? And so he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Now, I want us to stop right there. Here's this man. They're supposed to figure out which man who's carrying water they should find, right? It's not like there aren't thousands of people carrying water in the city of Jerusalem. I mean, how are they going to find one guy? Well, this is what we don't understand about the first century. Men never carried water jars. That was the job of a woman. And so to see a single man carrying a water jar would have tipped the disciples off that that must be our guy, right? And so that's how Jesus identifies this man. He says, follow him and say to the owner of the house as he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room? And where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. And the disciples left, and they went into the city, and they found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they prepared for the Passover meal. Now, when we come to this passage of Scripture in Mark, when we come to the Bible right here in Mark, Jesus and the disciples are on two totally different pages. The disciples are concerned about how are they going to pre prepare for the Passover. And Jesus is preparing to die. The disciples want to eat. And Jesus is thinking about death. Now, if we're going to walk with Jesus through the last 24 hours of his life, we really need to understand what's happening in the scripture. We've got to understand the context we must understand what is happening in the intimacy of the upper room. Now, sometimes as Christians, we get a little confused. We think that Jesus, we forget that Jesus was a Jew. Now, that might sound a little silly, but, but think about it for a while. Most of the times, we just assume that Jesus was like a, a Christian. You know, like you and me, we're Christians and we follow Jesus, so Jesus is a Christian. But Jesus is not a Christian. Jesus is a Jew. And Jesus and the disciples are getting ready to eat the Passover meal. Now, what is the Passover? Well, the Passover is the single most important experience for the Jews in all of their history. It's at the Passover that God delivers God's people out of slavery from Egypt. The Passover meal celebrates the salvation of the Jews. And so in Exodus chapter 12, we read, we hear these kinds of words. In Exodus chapter 12, God tells Moses to instruct the people to kill a lamb with no defects. That means no spots, no blemishes, a perfectly white lamb. To take the blood of that lamb and then to take that blood and put it around the door. And so they take that blood and they put, place it around the door and they eat then what is the Passover meal. And when the angel of death, the tenth, the tenth out of ten plagues in Egypt, when the angel of death passes over their homes, they are saved by this most terrible plague that all the Egyptians experienced. Do you remember this in the Old Testament? And so here is Jesus and the disciples, and they're celebrating this dinner. Now, there are some interesting aspects of this dinner that I think that we should focus on. Remember that when they eat this dinner, they're to eat a lamb, that pure, unblemished lamb, and they're to roast it over a fire. Why? Because they're in a hurry. They don't have time to bake it. They've got to roast it over a fire, and then they make bread without yeast. Why? Because they don't have time 
for the bread to rise. We've got an image right here from what, a, what a, the Last Supper could have looked like in the first century. I want to point some things out to you in this image. It's a little dark, but I think you can see it. If you notice that the table is almost on the ground. You know, sometimes our images of the Last Supper are Jesus kind of sitting and reclining at a table. But the truth is Jesus would kind of been like laying on the ground, kind of laying on a pillow, if you will. And so he and his disciples are, are basically on the ground eating this last supper together and there is the flat bread made without yeast and and there's all kinds of other symbolic foods that they're going to be eating bitter herbs and and they're going to be celebrating this meal together i want us to take a look at exodus chapter 12 verse 11 this is what the jews were instructed to do it says eat with your cloak tucked into your belt and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand eat in haste it is the Lord's Passover. Do you hear the urgency in that passage of Scripture? I mean, these people, you need to be in a hurry because our God is getting ready to do something. This is the night that Moses would go to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh would say to Moses, get your people out of here. I want you to go. This is the night that the Israelites, they had been slaves for 400 years, and they'd be freed from this tyranny of slavery. This is the night that God would save God's people. And so here is Jesus and the disciples, and they are sitting around this table, and they are praying the prayers, and they're telling the story, and they're singing the songs from the Haggadah, the Jewish liturgy, and Jesus is looking at that lamb. And I can imagine Jesus peering at that sacrificial lamb, recognizing that soon he would be the ultimate sacrificial lamb. That soon he would be the ultimate Passover. Jesus is getting ready to die. Now, this Passover meal seems a little different than ordinary Passover meals. If you ever celebrated a meal, a, a real Passover with with maybe Jewish friends, you'd recognize that Passover is characterized by celebration and feasting. I mean, it's a night of joy. I mean, a night of pure joy, and it lasts for hours, sometimes five hours for the Passover meal. But this seems like a more somber night. I mean, this night, when when the disciples are gathered in the upper room, this night seems like a somber night. In fact, Jesus butts into the conversation with these words. He says, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. The one who's eating with me. And they were saddened. And one by one they said to him, surely not I. And he said, it's one of the twelve. The one who dips the bread in the bowl with me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Talk about awkward dinner conversation, right? I mean, they're, they're having a party. They're celebrating. They're excited about the Passover. And suddenly Jesus butts in with this talk of betrayal and death. And did you hear it? Isn't it interesting that every last one of the 12 say, is it going to be me? Is it going to? to be me. The truth is, we know it's going to be Judas. And Jesus knows it's going to be Judas, but every last one of the disciples desert Jesus at some point in the night. Judas betrays him with a kiss. Peter, he denies him not once, not twice, but three times, and all the remaining ten desert Jesus. They leave him abandoned and all alone. Is it going to be me? I mean, Jesus could have yelled right out loud, yes, every single one of you are going to betray, deny, or desert me sometime this evening. What's so fascinating is that Jesus keeps on eating. He keeps on praying the prayers. He keeps on singing the songs. He keeps eating the Passover meal, even though he knows his friends are going to betray, deny, and desert him. It's as if Jesus is so focused, so focused on dying and getting to the cross 
that he doesn't let any of that distract him. He doesn't allow any of that to move his focus on what God has called him to do. Is it going to be me? Yes. Not only is it going to be one of the 12 disciple, disciples, but it's also going to be you and it's going to be me. Sometime in our lifetime, we have betrayed, we have denied, we have deserted Jesus in our lives. This morning, I want you to, to just take a moment and to think in your mind of a time where you have just betrayed, denied, or deserted Jesus. I know I can think of a number of times when I have been face to face with Jesus Christ and I have said the words, I don't even know you. Right in his face. How about you? How about you? When is it have you denied, deserted, or betrayed Jesus? Well, maybe you live a double life. Maybe you're one way here at church and one way at work or at school or even at home. Or maybe you're, when you're around a group of people, it's so hard for you to just stand up for Christ. I mean, maybe when you're at work and you're around a group of the guys, it's really difficult when they're making fun of other people to just stand up and say something about it. Or maybe some of you teenagers who, when you're at school, it's really hard to actually talk about your faith. It's just so much easier to betray him, to deny him, to desert him in those moments when he needs us the most. Too often, we betray, we deny we desert Jesus in our everyday life. But this is the good news. God doesn't leave us there. And neither does the church. In fact, in the early church in those first couple of centuries, many people were faced with death. I mean, they were faced with death. They were told either you deny Christ or we're going to kill you. And some of those people, in order to save their own skin, they denied Christ. And yet they knew, they knew that Jesus was real and they had failed him in the, in the moment that he needed them the most. And so what did the church do? The church used Lent, you know that 40 days of spiritual boot camp, to prepare them for the next time. I mean, Lent wasn't just let's give up caffeine. Lent wasn't just let's not eat chocolate. Lent was a 40-day boot camp to ready these Christians to be able to say yes in the face of death to Jesus Christ. I mean, this was serious. They prayed. They fasted. They read scriptures. They served the poor. I mean, they were out there in the trenches relearning what it meant to follow Jesus so that on Easter Sunday, they could be welcomed back in to the family of God. Welcome back into the fold. Now, there are some of us sitting right here in this worship space saying, I've walked away. I've walked away from Jesus in my life. I've denied him. I've deserted him. I've abandoned him in my life, and I want back in. I want a new relationship with God. And so I want to challenge you. If you're in that place in your life, use these 40 days to get reconnected, to get reconnected not only to God, but also to the church. Use this time as a period of spiritual renewal to say, you know what, God? I've messed up, but I'm willing and ready to be welcomed back in the fold. And so give God space in your life. Maybe it's through a small group. Maybe it's through the devotional. Maybe it's through opening your Bible for the first time in a long time. But give God room to transform your life. You see, Jesus doesn't give on, up on us. He didn't give up on those disciples, did he? I mean, even though Judas was going to betray him, Jesus still washed his feet that night. Even though Peter was going to deny him three times, he still invited him for dinner even though every single last one of those disciples would desert Jesus in a moment that he needed them the most, he still decides to have his last meal 
with the people he calls friends. Jesus peers across that table. He looks into the eyes of the disciples and he says, no matter what, no matter what you do, I'm going to do what I'm called to do. No matter what you do, I love you so much that I'm going to give my life not only for you, but for the entire world. Amen? Amen. Well, that night, Jesus does something really bizarre for the Passover meal. He takes a piece of matzah bread, flat bread, bread without yeast. You can take a look at the screen. There's a piece of matzah bread. I can imagine Jesus peering down at that matzah. And look, you see how it's striped? I can imagine Jesus looking at a piece of striped bread and saying, soon buy my stripes. They will be healed. And he takes that bread and he does something really weird with it. He looks at it and he gives, he gives thanks to God and he looks at the disciples and he says, take, eat. This is my body. This is your body, Lord? What does that even mean? And so they awkwardly start eating this piece of bread. And when the supper was nearly over, he took what it would have been the third out of four cups at the Passover meal and he gives thanks to it. And he gives his disciples, and this is what he says to them. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And he says to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. You see what Jesus is doing? He's changing the meaning of Passover. Whereas before, Passover was about what God did in Egypt. Passover is now about what God is getting ready to do through Jesus Christ. Jesus is giving the Passover meal a new identity. And we are going to be claimed by that new identity. Whereas the Jewish people were claimed by the identity set forth in the Passover meal, we now are claimed by the identity set forth in the Last Supper through holy communion. We remember what Christ has done. We remember what Christ is doing. We remember what Christ will continue to do. It is our new defining memory. Now, we are like the disciples. We human beings are hard learners. And so too often, instead of, allow, instead of allowing communion to be our defining memory, we allow our past, our denials, our betrayals, our desertions of Jesus to define us. We allow those sins in our lives to define who we are in our present condition. So what defines you? Maybe it's a series of bad relationships. Maybe it's a prison record. Maybe it's an adulterous affair. Whatever it is, if you allow that memory to define you over and over and over again. And Jesus says, enough. Enough. That's not what defines you. I am making a new defining memory for you and for everyone. We remember what Christ has done even though we've betrayed him. We remember what Christ has done even though we've denied him. We remember what Christ has done even though we desert him. Amen? Amen. God, before Christ, we were Gentiles. We were a no people. But in Christ, we are a people. We are the people of God. We were a nobody before the grace of God in our lives. But now we are somebody. You know, when Jews gather for the Passover meal, when they gather for that meal, they say they come to the table as slaves. And the truth is, we too come to the table as slaves, slaves to the sin, slaves to those past defining memories in our lives. But when we walk away from this table, when we walk away from the communion table, we are freed. Amen? Freed from sin, freed from the death of our past, freed to live in new covenant with Christ and with everyone else. Amen? We have a new defining memory in Christ Jesus. 
I mean, Jesus is standing at that table. And in one hand, he has the body. And in one hand, he has the blood. And he's looking out not only on the disciples, but on you and on me. And he's saying, I am doing this for all of you. I am breaking my body. I am pouring out my blood for all of you, for every single one of you. I am the new covenant. I am the new Passover. This morning, we're going to have the opportunity to experience, to remember what Christ has done through holy communion. But before we go to communion, I want us to to have an opportunity to pour our lives out to Christ, to confess those times to Christ that we've betrayed, that we've denied, that we've deserted Jesus. And so I want us to just take a little time to sit in silence and to say to God, God, have all of me. Have all of me, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Have all all of me. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we fail you every single day of our life. But praise God, we can't save ourselves. It's only by your overwhelming grace that we are saved. It's by your blood, it's by your body, it's by your sacrifice that we are freed. Freed from the slavery of sin and death. God, forgive us. Forgive us, we pray, for what we do and for what we fail to do as your people. God, we open ourselves up to leave you room in our lives for forgiveness, for transformation, and for reconciliation. And all God's people pray. Amen. This morning... We have a couple of special elements to our communion. This morning we have flatbread. To be reminded that, you know what, Jesus didn't create this meal. This is the meal that Jews ate for thousands of years, remembering that it's God. That is their salvation. He didn't create it, but he redefines it by giving his body and his blood for you and for me. And so on Thursday night, when Jesus was gathered with his disciples, he took something as ordinary as bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, This is my body, which is broken for you. I once met a lady who said they always use matzah in their faith tradition. Why? Because when you break the bread, it's like the sound of a cracking of a whip. And it reminds us that there was an ultimate sacrifice paid for the forgiveness of our sins. The cost was not cheap, but Jesus had to die for each and every one of us. And then when the supper was nearly over, he took what would have been the third of four cups. And he gave thanks to God. And he blessed those cups and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as as you drink it in remembrance
of me. And so every time we come to this table, we remember what Christ has done, even though we've deserted him. We remember what Christ has done, even though we've betrayed him. We remember that Christ has done, even though we deny him with our lives. Let us pray. Unbelievably gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on every one of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed, claimed by his blood. Make us one with each other, one in unity and ministry until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at that heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forevermore. Amen.